Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to another episode of this Desert Crusader Mark III in which we'll do a ton of work and this time I seriously mean it because it's gonna be like the entire double layer brush chipping, rust zones, detail painting and of course stowage. Basically everything to make sure the model will be ready for some desert weathering at the end of the video. So yeah, grab your sunshades and let's get to work. My friends, let's start by doing something we haven't done since like a long time. <laughs> I think the last time was the tiger. I'm talking about brush painted light color chips, you know, those that make the process twice as painful. Yeah, so buff and white Vallejo paints and I mixed them in almost equal ratios. It was four drops buff and five drops white. We need this color to be really light so it'll stand out on the surface. Then of course drying retarder from VMS, this was... I don't know how many drops, they say 30% so I guesstimated the amount. And two drops of tap water. This will give us a nice light desert color. Now, like I said, we haven't done this technique for several months because the last two models, the Sherman EZ8 and the T90, those were finished with the distressing method which partially replaces the first layer of light chips. It pretty much worked like a dream on the T90, considering it was 172nd scale model and it had ton of surface details, but I... it didn't work so well on the Sherman. Yeah, I mean, looking back at it after some time with, you know, no bias, I don't like the results on the Easy 8 as much as I did before. <laughs> And if I switch to full honest mode, let me tell you, this model is so much more fun compared to the Sherman. I mean, you know, when I compare how I felt painting the Sherman and how much fun I'm having with this model, the Sherman felt more like a chore. I didn't realize it back then and I don't exactly know why it was like that. I don't know, I suppose I'm not the biggest fan of Shermans. Even though they are one of the most popular armor subjects ever, like, you know, being up there in the holy trinity of mainstream tanks with Tiger and a T-34, but I, I don't know, it doesn't matter in the end because every model you build is an experience and if you can take away something from that, then it did you some good. <laughs> But anyway, rant over. So, as you were already able to observe, light colored sand chips look pretty cool on black. And this is an easy way to do more tasks with just one technique. Because when we think about it, how exactly would the paint chip? Well, the black would go first because it's the top layer, exposing the sand color underneath and then that sand color would chip revealing the khaki color and that would chip revealing the steel surface. But because we're not using the hairspray technique, so you know we can't really layer all those colors like in the real world, it's better to make the process more simple so that we don't need to spend an eternity basically chipping one model. So in this case I'm using the light sand color to simulate the light stone paint underneath the black patches and also the light scuffs. These light color chips happen when the paint gets scratched but it doesn't go all the way through so it'll leave just this light colored patch which is yeah it's light it's slightly lighter than the usual color and as an added bonus it'll make the dex technique pop nicely and make the entire effect more three-dimensional and it also works great as a way to highlight small details or outline their shape also, did you notice how subtle I tried to be this time? Tried, yeah, that's the important word here, because uh, I'm not sure if it shows, but to me it looks quite subtle. So another way to enhance the chipping is to use oil paints. Luckily I have a color that perfectly matches this tank and I diluted it completely down with enamel thinner until I had pretty much a consistency of a filter. And I just speckled it over the entire model. 
Using a diluted paint like this will subtly blend some of the larger light chips, especially on the black parts where they obviously stand out, but it'll also give the surface a more scuffed appearance, as if it was just you know, slightly worn, also dirty, dusty, uh, I don't know. It's one of those unspecified effects which can simulate pretty much whatever you want. <laughs> of course, speckling is sometimes hard to control, but luckily enough, oils have a long working time, so it's easy to remove any oversized, overly opaque, or just plain ugly specks or stains. <laughs> We can also control how much we will remove them. We can either wipe them off completely or just gently feather their edges to make the stain more integrated into the surface. Now we can proceed to the second stage with dark colored steel chips. This color was made from five drops of flat brown, three drops dark gray, one drop buff, and then the usual 30% drying retarder and one drop tap water. This is basically about repeating the previous technique, but this time it's all about painting steel chips inside the lighter ones, while keeping the light chip as a very thin outline. As I'm quite sure you immediately noticed, I used my hand as a paint dispenser. <laughs> Turns out, and I haven't realized it before, that unloading the brush twice, so first on a napkin or a piece of paper and then on your hand, ideally clad in a rubber glove, is the best trick if you want really, and I mean really small chips. After realizing this, I'm not surprised anymore why figure painters have messy thumbs. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Another aha moment was when I decided to not paint steel chips inside every single one light flake, so not all of them, but instead into the largest ones. The obvious outcome will be more subtle and also more natural looking. A model like this will also make us appreciate the first light layer of chipping, because Try imagining how would you spot the dark steel ones if they were painted over the black spots. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Overall, these two techniques brought a lot of life into this model and I was having a blast the whole time because I was enjoying the process and the results. The only downside is that it takes some time. Even if I managed to chip the entire model in three days, it was like eight hours a day. So yeah, it, it's a slow technique. <laughs> this actually brings me to one funny comment someone left under the four easy chipping tricks video. Um, apparently they were triggered by me saying chipping takes time and it's not the easiest technique out there because they felt like they needed to say something like, Closing and disliking video, chipping and weathering is the easiest thing in the modeling world and it never takes more than a couple of days. <laughs> Damn, son! <laughs> anyway, with the chipping done, I actually considered not adding any rust effects and by the way, I also chipped all the stowage and other details painted in their respective colors. But at the end of the day, I wanted to experiment with something, so I started with a light enamel rust wash. Continuing with the subtle theme of this project, I only applied it over the largest chips and into places where most chipping effects are concentrated. There's no quantum physics behind this, it just, again, it, it takes some time. And then I carefully blended it all with enamel thinner. Carefully is the important part here, because if you use too much thinner, not only will you wash away the rust altogether, but it'll spill over the surface like some sort of rust colored filter, and doing that over a light sand based color is not the best idea ever. In fact, I found myself going back over sections of the model and blending some stains even further, sometimes straight up eradicating them from existence, because although they seemed okay at first, when I looked at the model as a whole, you know, from normal viewing distance, they were just too much. But let's talk about the thing I wanted to experiment with. 
Well, it's nothing special really, I just felt like adding the light rust wash over those parts, which were made from sheet metal in real life. So, fenders, sand shields on the sides, storage boxes, tool clamps, you get the picture. But I didn't want to leave the armored parts unrusted, ladies and gentlemen. No, no, no. I wanted to use the dark streaking rust paint to actually create a slightly different result. <laughs> the process was identical, just the color was different. That's pretty much it. But what is worth mentioning is that I've had these two rust paints for a little bit over a year now, and the light rust wash is starting to degrade. Instead of a thin enamel paint, it's starting to become something like, you know, like a jello. It, I mean, it works as intended after I give it a good shake, but after about 10 minutes, the pigment will start to bead up. Not only it's more difficult to apply it properly, it also makes blending slightly more difficult. This shrieking rust effect works perfectly fine, but, you know, I mean, durability of enamel paints has been questionable since, like, forever. Like, some will last you for years and years and others they will start to dry up or degrade after a few months. I mean, I think some of you have experienced this as well, so I'm honestly not even surprised to be honest, and I'll just get a new bottle when the opportunity presents itself, but yeah, it, it's what it is. At this point I also painted those wires on the front of the tank and also the one on the side holding the large metal box. Um, this was just about using a medium grey acrylic paint as a base coat and then blending both rust washes on top. I'll be using this method to paint more details in a moment. Actually, pretty much right now. So, with all the chipping and rust tones out of the way, it's time to focus on details. But first let's appreciate the chipping and the subtle surface texture it gives us. I'm gonna be honest, my friends, I'm really happy with the results on this model. It almost makes me afraid to apply any dust tones on top of this. I'd rather just, you know, leave it like this, but, you know, let's not get ahead of ourselves. So, details. Most of them can be painted in the same medium grey color, so I mixed these two in equal amounts. First of all, wheels. Painting rubber in a medium grey is always better than using pure black or very dark grey in my opinion. It just... it looks more natural, you know, it looks more in scale, and once you apply some earth effects on top of it, the contrast... it, it, it won't be too strong. These took a while longer to paint because of those holes in each one of them, Although they'll receive a dust wash, so I can already see how the extra effort was totally pointless. Um, the same color was used to paint the machine gun. This one will also be weathered with a dust wash, and then it will be polished with graphite. And also all the metal tools. So, you know, the shovel blade, the crowbar, and the other no-name tool, and of course tow cables. These were quite tricky to paint because how intertwined they are, but it's all about using a brush that's small enough so it will allow us to paint precisely where we need. Metal cables usually have some kind of lub lub lubricated core which elongates their life and prevents corrosion. However, I'll approach them the same way as any other metal detail. This means an uneven rust wash using both the light and dark rust enamel paint, which I then blend with enamel thinner, and some stippling with a paintbrush. I'll give them a dust wash in the next episode, and I'll also polish them slightly with some graphite, so the results should be pretty okay. I mean, even now it clearly says those are metal cables, so I guess the technique served its purpose. And also, at least I didn't paint them silver. <laughs> but anyway, the same process was repeated on the remaining metal details. This is the tried, tested and verified method. 
When I mean, when I first learned this technique, I felt like it was some sort of magic trick, but yeah, it just works. Medium gray, or in fact, any type of gray, darker or lighter, it'll just create different effects. And an enamel rust wash on top and boom, very authentic looking metal effect. Again, this will be enhanced with some dust and graphite in the next episode, and the reason I'm keeping the polishing until the very end is because enamel thinner would dissolve the polished graphite. And I'm probably gonna weather this model using enamel paints, I'm not completely sure yet. The shovel has a wooden handle, and that means another tried and tested trick using old wood and Iraqi sand. Old wood is gonna be the base layer, and it's a fantastic color. It seriously looks like wood. That's old. And diluted Iraqi sand is just there to add some random highlights. On a bigger model, like 135th scale, we can use this approach to create some fake wood grain effect. But on smaller models, adding some random shapes is more than enough. And to finish it off, again as usual, a dark brown oil paint which I applied around the clamp and where the handle meets the blade. This was blended with a completely dry brush and it doesn't replicate anything specific. It's just a sort of fake shadow which will emphasize the details and it also gives the wooden part more tonal variety. So yeah, very simple, but extremely efficient and effective in my opinion. Now we're getting to the soft stowage, aka tarps and sandbag. I painted it all with acrylic paint and unfortunately I wasn't able to capture it in detail because I had to turn the model around like all the time. But it was done the same way like on the Sherman, so I'll just leave you a link in the description in case you wanna check it out. However, we can give it a try on the sandbag. Ironically enough, I found the same wood colors well suited for the natural fabric color of the sandbag. So I started by base coating it with old wood. I was a bit afraid the paint would start getting a satin sheen, because some Vallejo colors are like that for no apparent reason, but well luckily that didn't happen, and as you can see I used the wet palette to mix all the colors used on the stowage. So yeah, I then kept adding more Iraqi sand into the first paint and I kept the mixture totally diluted with tap water. Unfortunately, a half empty sandbag isn't the most detailed thing ever, and even those few wrinkles I added while I was sculpting it are unfortunately quite horizontal. Which means I wouldn't be able to add too many highlights or shadows even if I really wanted. Definitely not as much as I did on the tarp sitting the next door over. So even though I focused the lighter paint on those raised, so to say, parts, if we can call them that, I had to brush it as a glaze over those shallow wrinkles as well. So instead I decided to try something different. And that means I added more Iraqi sand into the mixture and I used the so-called stippling technique, which is used in miniature painting to simulate texture on fabric and leather. One of my patrons, who's a miniature painter, explained it to me, and he called it chipping for fabric, which really caught my attention because we all know how much I like chipping. And if I understand it correctly, it's basically about adding highlights and shadows not in form of brush strokes, but rather small random dots. I think this technique has some potential in the future, and maybe a flat piece of stowage like this was the best way to try it out for the first time. I mean, there's nothing eye-catching about the sandbag, but quite honestly, I don't know what else could be done here. I had a color stock photo of a sandbag in front of me the whole time, and basically, this is how it looked. <laughs> anyway, let's try some acrylic techniques on the searchlight. I'm gonna try to paint a fake lens effect here. 
again wet palette and I'll be working with light and dark grays with a slight hint of light blue. Light grey was used as a base coat. I tried using silver on a test piece, but it didn't look very good and it was impossible to layer more paint on top of it. So yeah, light grey, but not too light. Then I mixed a darker grey and painted it on the top half of the lens. This is supposed to be a shadow, you know, cast by the oval shape of the searchlight. And then I did the same with a very light grey, almost white, on the bottom half, where natural light would hit. Unfortunately, it was very hard to film the entire process. I think it shows how I wasn't able to see what I was doing. So yeah, I took the entire process off screen and finished it off like that. The final touch was to give it a generous coat of clear enamel gloss to make it look like glass. And I mean, it doesn't look very convincing, but hey, at least I gave it a try. I guess I'll just make it look really dusty in the next episode and hopefully it'll look somewhat presentable. And just like usual, in a true Uncle Night Shift fashion, I couldn't miss the opportunity to add some world beat chipping with the usual silver Tamiya paint. I find it quite lucky that the roof of this tank is welded because usually your everyday ordinary British tank is completely riveted and bolted together. I'm happy to see their designers were starting to get the hang of this new modern technique called welding. <laughs> no, I'm just messing around. But still, does anyone know why British tanks were assembled like this? Like all bolts, rivets and almost no welts? Anyway, I think that'll be it for tonight ladies and gentlemen. I mean, I've got the model ready for the final weathering effects, which means mostly dust in this case. Or does it? Because, I mean, this tank operated in Tunisia and if you look it up, Tunisia isn't all sand and rocks. A lot of it is actually just dirt, like just dirt, bushes, you know, quite ordinary stuff. In fact, that was the exact reason why these crusaders were painted like this. The light stone color, like the base coat, was deemed too bright for the Tunisian landscape, so tanks painted like this had to be darkened with patches of either black or very dark brown. And those arriving fresh from the UK in khaki green were left like that. I'm keeping this fact in mind the whole time since I started painting the model, and although I have a few ideas in my mind, I still don't have a clear picture. So I suppose the next episode will be… uncertain. <laughs> nah, we'll just use a bunch of tried and true methods and hopefully we'll cook up something that looks at least somehow presentable. <laughs> so before we get there, I'll just leave you with a big thank you. I seriously appreciate all the support and also the fact that you made it all the way to the end of the video. And I also want to give some love and recognition to my amazing patrons who make this weekly thing possible. There's a pretty high chance they already know how the model looks finished and I mean including the scenic base because yeah, this model obviously needs a scenic base. So if you'd like to join them and you know, get to know all of this behind the scenes stuff. I mean, no one is holding you back. <laughs> so if you decide to join, you'll receive stuff like almost daily photo updates from my workbench. I mean, yeah, they're not daily, but they're quite regular. I mean, there's already way over 1000 posts there. And also one week early ad free videos. So, you know, the weathering episode not a week, but instead just a few clicks away, and also DMs. Basically a bunch of mildly interesting stuff, so again, if you're interested, head over there and give it a thought. It would help me immeasurably. <laughs> anyway, that's all I have for you tonight, my friends, so I hope you're having a fantastic day and I wish you even more amazing weekend. Also, I hope you're building your models, and if you're not a modeler, I hope you'll get your first kit sometime soon, because it's seriously a ton of fun, you should totally give it a shot. And 
yeah, I'm just gonna finish my coffee, then I'll go outside because because I started recording this as I return from my bike ride and my bike needs some linkage maintenance, so yeah, I'm gonna do that. And then I'll be editing the video until like late night or very early morning, so <laughs> yeah, anyway. I'll see you ladies and gentlemen in the next one. Cheers!